This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. the 10th meeting of the audit committee. Um, the clerk ha has not received apologies from any member for today's meeting. Um, can I remind members that, that they are obliged to declare any relevant financial or other interest before and during each committee meeting? Does any member have anything to declare? No? Okay. Um, can I uh, inform members that the draft minutes of the meeting held on the 9th of December uh, 2020 and 14th of December are uh, at page five of the meeting pack. Uh, and to ask members if they're content uh, that the minutes are a true reflection of the proceedings of the meeting. Great. Uh, okay. Uh, I'll uh, sign uh, the minutes in due course. Um, move on to the next agenda. Uh, can I inform members that there are three items under matter for raising at pages 16 to 25 of the meeting pack? Uh, item 4.1 of page 16 of the meeting pack is a list of the decisions taken under standing order 1159. Uh, can I ask members to note? No, no. <clears throat> okay. Um, item 4.2 item 4 uh, at page 20 of the meeting pack is a table of the key themes arising uh, from the various communications. Uh, which the committee received from individuals. Can I ask members of the contempt to note? No. No. Okay. Uh, items 4.3 at page 24 of the meeting pack is a response from the audit office providing information on bids and easement on the January, January monitoring round. Uh, can I, uh, members contempt to note? No. Okay. Um, we'll move to the next item of business if members are agreed. Uh, commencement of part three of the Public Services Ombudsman Act, uh, Northern Ireland 2016. Oral evidence from Northern Ireland Public Service Ombudsman. Uh, can I refer members to page 26 of the meeting pack for relevant papers and remind you uh, that the Speaker wrote to the committee on the 24th of November 2020 advising that the Commission had received a formal request from the Public Service Ombudsman to commence part three of the Public Service Ombudsman Act uh, to enable her office to exercise a complaints uh, standard authority role uh, and asking whether the Ombudsman's resource plan uh, are appropriate to allow her to carry out the complaints uh, standards role effectively. So, uh, with that said, can we welcome uh, to the meeting uh, um, Ms. Margaret Kelly? Uh, if Sarley could bring them in. Are they in there yet, Clerk? No? Um, not yet. I'll bring them in now. Okay. That's Margaret in now. <clears throat> okay. uh, welcome, uh, Margaret Kelly, Ombudsman, Mr. Sean Martin, Acting uh, Deputy Ombudsman, and Mr. John McGinnity, Finan uh, Director of Finance and Corporate Services. Uh, can advise you uh, that this session and the next session are being recorded by Hansard and the transcripts will be published on the committee web page. Can I uh, invite uh, the Ombudsman to brief members, please? Margaret, you're very welcome. Uh, thanks again for joining us. And we're all entirely remote today, so uh, this is the first. So hopefully it'll run smoothly. Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, and my apologies, I was having some difficulty just connecting. So thank you for the opportunity to talk to committee, um, both about the Complaint Standards Authority and after this about the business plan. If I could just say a few words, I know we've provided you with two papers. Um, so if I could just say a few words to begin with about the Complaint Standards Authority. Um, so the Complaint Standards Authority provisions are contained in Part 3 of our NIPSO Act in Sections 34 to 42. And they were tabled by um, what was then the Committee for the Office of the First and Deputy First Minister as the bill was going through with a view to future commencement and as part of that scrutiny. 
the vision for the Complaints Standards Authority was very much about developing a valuing complaints culture across public services, a focus on learning and improvement, which committee know um, is a personal focus for me, um, that all public bodies would have standardised complaints procedures that would be streamlined and that there would be a focus on early, early resolution as well as information on complaints activity across the public sector and an opportunity for benchmarking. Um, in order to prepare for the eventuality and without prejudice to the decision of the Assembly, we have undertaken a substantial amount of work. We've done a significant piece of research and we've included a little bit of information about that. We hope to publish that in April or May. And that research has shown really quite significant differences in the number of stages and the approaches to complaints across different public bodies. It's shown that both public bodies and complainants are often unclear about formal and informal aspects of complaints. It's shown that for complainants themselves, complaining often has a significant impact on them and their families, and that there is often a lack of support and guidance, as well as being quite complex and confusing. And when we talk to complaint handlers and managers, they thought their role was crucial but did feel that it was complex and challenging and something that they required more support and training with. Um, there is a comparative function in many of the other jurisdictions, and in particular in Scotland and in Wales, this function has been implemented on a statutory basis. Um, in Scotland in particular, they've had quite a long period of time and have quite a lot of learning, and the current um, Scottish Public Services Ombudsman, Rosemary Agnew, said she would be quite happy to speak to any of the committees around the experience of Complaint Service Standards Authority um, in her jurisdiction. <laughs> Even the Ombudsman's Office, who don't have statutory powers, have been moving to this approach on a voluntary basis, with many of them introducing a framework and standards um, for complaint handling, because I think they all see it as a mechanism to, to solve and to provide clarity for complainants. So we have reviewed and taken account of some of the most significant recent reports where complaint handling has been an issue, reports like Home Truths, um, the review of leadership and governance into Muckamore, and the O'Hara report. We've also established quite a level of engagement with public bodies, and we've established some informal complaint networks to support complaint handlers and public bodies in their role. We have done some drafting on both a statement of principles and a model complaints handling procedure, both of which would be required um, if this is commenced, and they are will be in a shape where we would be able to go to consultation on them. I think in terms of our overall approach to this, I would say that we want to take a supportive approach, an approach that supports best practice. We have a project plan that has been prepared to show the different stages of consultation, co-development and training that would be necessary. And we've also developed a set of criteria um, which would allow us to look at the different public body sectors and to begin to make some decisions about who to engage first. So it wouldn't be possible to engage all public bodies and on the basis of our work, I think it would be a matter of taking one or two sectors to begin with, and then with a phased rollout across the different sectors. Um, so we would be looking for a very consultative process, a process of co-development and a learning process. And we have put quite a lot of that work in place in terms of preparing for it. Um, and now it's, I'm quite happy to engage with the committee on questions or any detail on some of that work. Thank you very much, uh, Margaret. Appreciate um, your presentation. Um, as the implementation of the Complaint Standards Authority function will be phased, Margaret, what is likely to happen in twenty one in the twenty one twenty two year, and what level of resources attached to each element? Um, 
So I, I maybe say a little bit about the 21-22 year and then I ask um, John if he will to come in on the resources. So as we currently stand, I have a meeting with the Assembly Commission. So we have written to the Assembly Commission with the support of the committee to look at asking for commencement. So I have that meeting with the Assembly Commission next week and also um, a meeting planned later on this month with the um, Committee of the Executive Office to look at a scrutiny role around it. Um, once that happens, and if there is a decision to commence, um, by my understanding around some of the processes of that, um, and I think the Audit Committee has been given a role to have a, a more detailed look at it too, is that that could happen by May or June. If that happens by May or June, that allows us to begin to use the resources. So as we currently stand, until that is commenced, we can't use those dedicated resources for CSA. And once commencement happens, we would have six months to work on a statement of principles and to consult on that, a model complaints handling scheme and consult on that. And then they need to, the statement of principles needs to go to the assembly, to the floor of the assembly um, yeah. for support by resolution. And I don't know, John, if perhaps you'd say a little bit about where we are in terms of resources. Surely, Margaret. Yes. Uh, am I? Am I? Can I be heard? Yes. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, wasn't certain. Um, yes. In terms of resourcing, we, as part of our budget proposals for twenty one twenty two, we built in provision for a team to be in operation from from for planning purposes at the start of of the financial year. Uh, the, the total amount of funding. It, in, was it, just over two hundred thousand pounds, which comprises mainly staffing, a staffing component of around one hundred and sixty thousand, uh, and around fifty thousand for non-staff costs associated with training materials and and other uh, resources to get the, the function off the ground. Uh, that that planning those planning assumptions assumed commencement from as early as April in the event that uh, we're not in a position to commence the function fully by the start of April we would be availing of the opportunities within in-year monitoring rounds the first of which is in June in order to adjust our requirement as necessary so as it stands at the moment we are resourced for a position that would have seen us commence from the 1st of April, but in the event that that is not, does not prove to be possible, we will uh, adjust our requirements in the year. Thank you, John. Um, I'll open to the floor for other uh, members. Um, so we'll start with um, Joanne Bunting. Uh, Joanne. Thanks, Chairman. Um, no, I suppose the questions that I have been covered now in the briefing about resources and what's been scheduled in and the time frames, those were kind of questions I have. There's just one other thing with regard to um, the strategic plan, one that we'll have. Can I just clarify with you guys to whom you're accountable over your risk? Um, so we, so maybe if I just explain, and then um, John, if there's anything on it that you need to come in on. So obviously, as an officer of the assembly, Joanne, I'm accountable via the audit committee and accountable to the assembly. But I also have an independently appointed audit and risk committee, um, and that currently has um, three members on it, and then two of them are about to go. Um, so we are currently have just done a recruitment exercise and they we they meet four times a year and we have a full risk register with them um, and they review on uh, on each occasion our risk register um, and that's I don't I don't know if that's publicly available but it's certainly available to committee and or to the audit and risk committee and it gets reviewed John I don't know if there's anything else on that yeah, well, I, I can just maybe add a little bit to that, Margaret. We we have a we've we have a risk register in place that that is drawn around what are the fundamental risks as we see them at any point in time to the delivery of our of our key strategic objectives. Now, there's another part of this meeting that's going to discuss our business plan and, str and strategic objectives, but there are five of them, and at any given time, we maintain uh, uh, detailed. 
account of what, what the risks are to the achievement of each of those, what measures we have in place at present to manage those and what further measures we should be considering. To answer the question around accountability, as Margaret has explained, uh, we present and are interrogated on, on our risk register quarterly at Audit and Risk Committee. We also refer to, in some detail in our annual report and accounts to the maintenance of our risk register and uh, within within our annual report and accounts there's also an invitation for, for the risk register to be shared really with anybody upon request. Uh, so we, we keep a, a regular review process in place uh, regarding our key risks. Thank you, Chairman. Apologies, I clearly jumped ahead. Um, but that's okay, we can come back to when the time comes. Thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, Emma Rogan? Emma, Emma available? Yes. Emma, you're on mute currently. Apologies. Thanks, Chair. Um, I just have a couple of questions. Um, the strategic plan talks about um, better learning um, from mistakes, etc. Can you give some details on how um, the strategy for achieving better learning? Can you hear me okay? Yes, sorry. I think I probably need to mute. Um, Thanks, sorry, and I think I probably needed to make my mic apologies. So I, I think there are two elements to that. So there is an element of the Complaints Standards Authority work that will allow for that improvement in learning, and that is part of the focus of it, um, because quite often at the moment, sometimes it's unclear what's a complaint and what isn't. It's very unclear about how public bodies actually use their complaint system. So sometimes people have one stage, sometimes they've two, sometimes they've three, sometimes they've more than that before people can actually come through to the ombudsman if they're still unhappy. And if you try to benchmark or compare across public bodies, the actual number of complaints and, and the outcomes of those complaints, that becomes very hard to do. And I think that makes it quite difficult to build an improvement and learning um, culture. So we are hoping that some of the work that we undertake in terms of the Complaint Standards Authority will assist that and will assist um, public representatives to actually look across the public bodies and be able to know the number of complaints, how they were dealt with and the outcomes. And when I speak to the Ombudsman in Scotland, Rosemary Agnew, um, she said that, that is, those things are now beginning to change that culture and build more of a focus on improvement and learning. The other part of that work, which probably comes under the bit around the business plan priorities, is that the committee supported um, the appointment of two staff to, to support some of that improvement in learning. And they will look currently and outside that framework of Complaint Standards Authority at the number of complaints we get, the number of complaints different public bodies get, where are the themes in those complaints. So really recently, um, we went out on a thematic approach. We had three reports to do with continuing health care, which is when um, an adult in social care has a primary health care as opposed to a social care need and should be able to access their social care place being, or their care place being funded. And we've had at least seven, with a few more coming in, of people who haven't been able to access that and where the process for that is very unclear. So we've gone out recently to say across three different trusts, we've had three different complaints, all from people who thought they were entitled under health needs to have their care paid for. There was no clear process in place for assessing that. They, we have been awaiting the outcome of a Department of Health consultation since 2017 to put a new process in place on that. And it is clear to us that that is very difficult for families. Now, we have done that within current resource. I would hope that once we've got new learning and development staff in place, that they will be able to pull together more of those thematic reports. They'll be able to share them 
both with the public but also with elected representatives and we will be able to share more of the learning from that with for example the department and say that we can see there's a growing problem on this there actually needs to be some work done on that so one of my plans for this year is a to appoint those staff as we have in the budget and we're just working on job descriptions and getting those getting us ready to do that and B, to put together a plan that can look at how can we pull together more thematic information? How can we see the trends and complaints? Um, and for me, there's a real bit of that that's about value and complaints, but it is also a bit that where perhaps you start to spot problems before they become really huge, enormous problems that leads to things like um, the Home Truth Report. So, and that's how I see that being put in place over the coming year. And once we have that plan in place, I'm happy to come and talk about it a bit more with the committee. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I have just one more question, if, if you, you don't mind. Um, the old initiatives, the, the operation um, around that um, part of the, the the paper that we, we got and um, do you want to see policy changes in the areas that that will highlight is that what that if you, you intend expanding on that operation of the own initiative and then would you want to see the changes come into place after that and um, so our current own initiative report is pip and i hope we will be and we're currently um looking at the response from the department from communities and capita on that and taking out looking at their comments um, and I'm hoping that we will have that published at the end of March. Um, and I think those own initiatives are an in-depth level of investigation that do highlight a need for change. Um, we chose to focus that on further evidence. And I think even if you look at the second independent review of PIP, further evidence came up as an issue where there did whether there is clearly an issue and whether there did need to be some change. So the opportunity with own initiative is that we can go in and look at something in a bit more depth or where we can see an issue and perhaps have not yet had a complaint and um, we can actually will can go in and look and investigate that um, and mm -hmm. i would think that what we would be doing from that is pulling out those lessons sharing those lessons and um, sharing them with committee and other assembly committees and beginning to say these are the things that might that need to change if we find um, maladministration or if we find systemic maladministration which for us is the same mistakes getting repeated a number of times and therefore for me an indicator that something in that needs to change yeah uh, thank, thank you Margaret. Uh, thanks Emma uh, uh, just members uh, 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 I don't have some questions but th this particular part of the session is supposed to be focused on determining whether the resource plans are appropriate so any other questions have beyond that are for the next part of the session. Uh, the, uh, Margaret and her colleagues are going to be joining us for uh, quite a while. So um, if you could leave more general questions to the next part of the session uh, and focus specifically on uh, the resource plans. So with that said, uh, uh, Alan Chambers would like to come in. Um, if he has any questions. Hello, Alan. Right, I need to answer questions, sure. Thank you very much. That's right. Thank you, Alan. Uh, and uh, Jim Allister, please. Uh, hey, Jim. You can hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yes. I want to ask uh, the activation of part three, which I think is a very good idea. But what I want to know is my constituents who make complaints to public bodies. What changes do you expect them to see in consequence of that? And my reason for asking that is this. I've had so many cases where people make complaints be it to their council or whatever. They have a three-stage process. It all reads very impressively, but the practicality of it is uh, you, get, you don't get the satisfaction stage one. Someone reviews it allegedly at stage two. You still get the same answer. It goes to stage three, you still get the same answer. There seems to be an unbending mindset within some that their purpose is just to rubber stamp, never to concede that they've done anything wrong. Will that change? 
Um, so, Jim, I'm, I'm going to answer and then perhaps I'll ask Sean to come in because he's done quite a lot of the work. I would like to think that that would change. Um, I think we want a streamlined process. Um, um, and complainants do tell us that they feel like they get the, that they go through three or four stages and get the same response. So, A, I think we need a streamlined process. B, I think we need to be very clear about the different elements of those stages and why they are different. So we will aim for early resolution, which is in everybody's interest. But if that goes beyond the first stage, then complainants need to know that the second stage is not just a repetition. And we will be doing some work around a model complaints handling um, scheme, which I hope will support that. And obviously, there is then the opportunity for complainants to come through to the Ombudsman. Now, there is a bet with the complaints standards that you would be trying to get as many of those complaints appropriately resolved as early as possible. And it's not going to happen overnight. I mean, I think in Scotland, and um, when I speak to Rosemary Agnew, it has taken maybe five years to really begin to shift. So it's not an overnight response. But we are working on the detail and we will be consulting on both the statement of principles and that model scheme. So there will be an opportunity um, to feed in and for people to use their experience and their constituents' experience. Um, Sean, I don't know if you'd like to add anything to that. Yeah, certainly. And apologies to the committee. Um, my camera is, is facing backwards and won't turn around for me. Um, <laughs> so let me turn around. So apologies that I have no camera. But just, I mean, in terms of our current thinking, it is, as Margaret has outlined, in terms of a two-stage process, where first stage primarily focused around local resolution is, is there a way to resolve the issues that the person has raised? And then a single investigation stage with, with a detailed, focused investigation around the issues so that people aren't put through the effort of, of a number of stages where... Uh, the answer to their complaint, in essence, doesn't really change. We don't think that's a particularly good use of resources and actually takes a lot of time and energy on the complainant's part to pursue their complaint, and we don't think that's beneficial. So I think, you know, what we're looking at is a way for the organisation to try and resolve the complaint. If they can't resolve it, then they need to investigate it, do it thoroughly once, and at the end of that process, there is the sign posting to the ombudsman. So in terms of bringing about that change, I think we see training as a really, really important part of that. So providing people with the skills to properly investigate complaints for those that haven't been able to be resolved. So I think, you know, as we roll out the model complaints handling procedure, we will also be rolling out a substantial amount of training with each of the sectors to support that. You know, and, and I think changing that culture where actually complaints are valued as an insight into the way people perceive and, and receive services so that People value that and then can make changes on foot of it. And I think for us, it is it is a project that will take some time because there is just there's the introduction of the model complaints handling procedures, the training that goes with that, and then the cultural change, you know, in organisations to value complaints, to report openly on complaints, to learn from complaints, and build that back into to their own organisation for improvement. So I think that's how we see it improving. You know, reducing the number of stages clear time scales for that, and then if the organisation hasn't been able to deal with it, uh, signposting to the Ombudsman. Well, it can only get better, so I hope it works out. Thank you, Jim. Um, so uh, th thanks very much, uh, Margaret, for, for, for that first part of, of the session uh, and to your officials as well. Uh, we'll move on to the, the next item, which members did have questions on. Um, which is the Northern Ireland Public Service Ombudsman Strategic Plan and Business Plan, uh, oral evidence from uh, the Northern Ireland Public Services Ombudsman. So can I refer members to page 34 of the meeting pack uh, of uh, the papers uh, and invite uh, Margaret to brief members on the strategic plan uh, and business plan. Thank you, Chairman. Um, so our existing strategic plan runs from 2020 to 2023, and committee were already given that in February. And there is, of course, much in the plan that reflects our core role and purpose, and that will remain constant over the next three years. Um, 
but we also and to that to my end to that end in planning for the three years ahead it is my intention in the coming year 21 22 to produce a new strategic plan a new three-year strategic plan and it's also my intention to develop that plan with key stakeholders and to have a level of engagement and consultation with state key stakeholders on that um, but in order to ensure that the committee is really conversant with my focus for the year ahead, I have drawn out those additional key business objectives that I wanted to add to our ongoing work. And I put those in the context of the existing strategic plan and the NIPSO core values, which I put in the paper. So the additional strategic objectives that I'd really like to draw committee's attention to um, are in this paper. So under strategic objective one, to provide a high quality, impartial and independent investigation service. We put in a couple of additional business objectives. So we want to undertake a user satisfaction survey with people who have used the NIPSO service. This hasn't been done to date and will be the first one that we've done. Um, and we are in train to begin that in April of this year. And alongside that, we want to undertake a public awareness survey. So a small public awareness survey, which we haven't done before either, to look at what is the general public's awareness, understanding and knowledge of NIPSO. And if they were having difficulty with a complaint or were very dissatisfied with the public body having complaint, complaint, do they know how to find their way to us? And I want to use those both to inform the strategic plan for the forthcoming three years, but also to provide a baseline data so that we can measure and develop the service in future years. So that is going to be a key objective for me as we go forward. Um, under business objective 1D, I have put in our own initiative report. So to publish the own initiative investigation into personal independent into the personal independence payment and to ensure the dissemination and learning from that because I think there's always a risk that you publish the report and you don't do the follow-up bit. So I want to make sure we have a very clear plan for the dissemination and learning from that and then to identify other own initiative investigations, both rapid and in-depth, to draw attention to other issues where there may need to be shared learning and perhaps to reassure the committee that one of our areas for assurance audit by our external auditors this year is our own initiative investigation and our procedures and processes for how we've conducted that. So that is ongoing at the moment. Um, under strategic objective two, to build confidence in local government by regulating and promoting the Northern Ireland Local Go um, Government Code of Conduct, I had put in some specific business objectives around promoting awareness and learning of the code. And I want to review our current level of engagement with the key stakeholders who will be using the code and to develop an engagement plan over the course of this year to provide additional and ongoing opportunities for engagement and learning. So I have, over the last five months, um, reached out to quite a number of the key stakeholders on this. So NAC, SOLAS, NILGA, and begun a process, as some of you know, of reaching out to all of the political parties um, to actually both listen to and understand where people are with the code, but also to enable me to think about how do we put a plan in place to really promote the code and to ensure that councillors aren't breaking the code inadvertently and that we are all working on the same side, which is looking for really good standards in public life. So I want to really make that engagement a focus to enable us to bring that forward. Um, under strategic objective three, we've talked about, which is to improve complaints handling. And we've talked about CSA, so I'm not going to go through it, um, but I am happy to answer other questions on that and also to bring forward, um, once we do the work with the Commission, to bring forward to Audit Committee the more detailed pack and briefing on that. Under strategic objective four, to be an accountable and ethical public service organisation that pursues excellence and continuous improvement. Some additional business objectives have been about developing a digital strategy to support the continued expansion, improvement and efficiency in our service delivery. 
and to develop an updated business continuity plan, taking account of what we have learned um, during the COVID-19 pandemic and being able to keep our service running. Under business objective 4C, to look at improvements in organisational performance and staff development, I want to develop the new strategic plan with agreed strategic provision and priorities. Um, I want that to include a process of external and internal stakeholder engagement. And as part of that, we are undertaking a staff survey um, to get staff views and engagement on that. And I put a process around that, which should kick off in early April to enable that to happen. And then just under strategic objective five, um, to support learning from complaints and improve public services, as I said, we are just in the process of writing those job descriptions and um, hopefully appointing those new staff and putting in place a clear learning and improvement plan. Um, under my governance and accountability, I'm just aware of the committee's current review of governance um, and just wanted to reiterate my commitment to fully engaging with the committee on that. It's actually an important issue for me that I take seriously and, and I welcome the opportunity to discuss it with committee. And also then, once that is complete, to work with committee to review and update the memorandum of understanding, um, which again is important to have in place. I'm not going to go through resource requirements, but I know that um, John will be happy to take us through them. And I just want to say that in providing committee with both the existing strategic plan and my key priorities for the year ahead, it's my aim to ensure the committee is fully conversant with the focus that I currently have um, and that they are clear where we're going in terms of our core statutory obligations and functions, but also with our focus on access to justice and better complaints handling and sharing of those lessons. And those are conversations that I really welcome with committee um, and I'm more than happy to answer any other questions. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Margaret, for that uh, very detailed um, presentation. Um, Margaret, we, we know your resource requirements for 21-22. Uh, are, uh, are there any areas where you might see NIPSO declaring easements or identifying pressures in the year and likely reasons for that? And John will probably answer that question. John, is sure. there, would um, you like to? Happy to come in on that. Um, we've already mentioned the possibility in one area in, in, in terms of the time scale for commencement of our complaints st standards authority function that there, there is uh, as we look at it now the possibility that we will uh, we will not require the full year equivalent of, of of the resources to undertake that function that's uh, that's principally simply a, a timing issue which uh, we, we have been aware of from the outset but we felt that it was prudent to build into our budgetary plans for next year uh, uh, the provision for full year always knowing that there would be the opportunity to to identify any reduced requirements as the year progresses. In terms of areas where we think there might be uh, calls, additional calls on our services, uh, in relation to the unknown around the, the bounce back effect, if one can describe it as that, of the potential additional complaints that will arise or could arise in the aftermath of the pandemic, that, that could be arising both from the pandemic itself, but also from the, the the lag that will have built in 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 people not perhaps wishing to bring forward complaints to the office in in the times that we have been in. So there is, we think, the possibility that there is there will be a, a residue of of complaints that have built up, and in that event, we we would foresee uh, the possibility that we would wish in in-year monitoring rounds during the course of 21-22 uh, to uh, approach yourselves as a committee and then the Department of Finance uh, to seek some additional in-year resources to support that. Uh, those are the two key areas where we see the potential for some variation. Uh, Margaret may, may have others in her mind or Sean, but uh, th those were the key areas for, from, our, for, from our planning perspective at the moment. Okay, thank you, John. Um, I'm going to invite members in. I'm conscious that Joanne and uh, uh, Emma have, have asked questions relevant to this, uh, but uh, I'll go through the same order. Joanne, have you any further questions um, for Margaret or John? 
I do. Thanks, Chairman. Um, I appreciate it. I'm sorry that I jumped ahead. Um, just with regard back to the risk situation, um, there's a couple of things I, I want to ask, but the first is around risk. Do you folks consider that there's a weakness, a potential weakness in the system um, in circumstances where we are to some extent responsible for your budget and your budget allocation in, in that regard, but also um, but we don't know anything really of your risk and the potential that there may be for for financial implications arising out of those risks. I mean, is that a is that a flaw in the current system? And in circumstances where I appreciate you've got your own risk register and so on, you'll have recommendations from your internal and external auditors. But what what mechanisms are there in place to ensure that you you do address? Um, matters that have been brought to your attention via those routes. And then, Chairman, if we can come in on another issue, but this is my first, the first one. Um, so I'm going to ask John to come in after me, John, if that's okay, on, on some of sure. that. Sure, yeah. Um, do I can, it's, it's an interesting question. Do I consider there's a weakness in the system? One of the things that discussion with committee has prompted me to do has been to go off and look at the other ombudsmen and, and how they're constituted. Um, and that ability for me is a, as an officer of the Assembly, and I think it, when I've looked at all of the review and the academic literature around ombudsmen, that accountability to the legislature, which whichever one that may be, is actually a key element of that. Um, I do think that in terms of our risks, and I'm happy to share our risk register with the committee, um, we do have a very thorough plan. I do feel we have a very thorough risk register. We talk about it at HSMT and review it at HSMT. We review it at our art committees, and there are particular ones of those risks that will be reviewed by either internal or external audit. And then we have in place an update to that risk register. So any actions that are arising from that, we then are required to fulfil those actions and both ARC and our auditors will look at those. So in terms of an actual process that says, here is risk, it's been reviewed, here are some things we think you need to do, you need to have these done by here, have you those done? I think that process is very firmly in place um, and it might be that committee is perhaps not as familiar with that, or it might be that, that that is something in terms of that risk register the committee would want to see. Um, John, I don't know if you've anything that you'd like to add on that, or if I've done yeah. a good job of doing that. Yeah. Well, yeah, uh, and anything that I would say would, would absolutely not wish to preempt the current review of, of governance that, that's uh, underway, or indeed the committee's intention to revisit uh, the memorandum of understanding that's in place governing the accountability relationships. But uh, even within our existing me memorandum of understanding, there is a clear commitment on our side to transparency around making available any material, including risk registers that may help inform or provide assurance that we are uh, monitoring the key risks to the achievement of our objectives and taking appropriate action. Uh, and in, in fact, it was the very existence of our of our, uh, our corporate risk register that helped inform us when we came to the committee first back in October with our budgetary proposals for next year. We, we would took account with of uh, issues arising in our in our risk register in framing our, our approach to presenting the budgetary figures to the committee. So there is, there is a link there already, and, and as Margaret has explained, there is a pretty robust set of arrangements in place for our our um, risk register to be challenged and interrogated by both our audit and risk committee and our internal audit function so uh, the risks are, the risks around our risk register are are modest it would be my assessment okay all right John. Um, yeah thanks chairman folks i yeah. appreciate your calendar on that um, and it's useful to kind of understand because it, it's Odd to see an audit committee that doesn't have a risk element to it, and obviously there may be budgetary factors that come into play. So it's useful to understand the process. And um, my next issue is with regard to um, the complaints handling that you're about to set up. 
and it's not resource based but around the general principles of it because you mentioned something there that, that drew my interest so in circumstances where margaret you either receive a complaint about or you have uh, initiated your own investigation and um, so let's use an example um much more difficult because of the current criminal case but if we use the o'hara report so obviously a series of uh, findings and recommendations from that, none of or few of which seem to have been implemented despite the passing of several years. Does this uh, additional function afford you the opportunity to go back and revisit? Do you have the authority to hold public bodies to account in circumstances where they have not implemented the recommendations that you made and so on? Does this new function afford families an opportunity to complain to you in circumstances where you initiate your own investigation? How does this work, please? Okay. Um, so I'm going to try and answer a bit of that, Joanne, but I'm also going to ask Sean to come in. So, um, so I agree with you that quite often there are investigations and reports and you get lots and lots of findings, but actually getting those into practice can be really difficult. Um, and I do think that both the Complaint Standards Authority role and the own initiative provides an opportunity to do that. I suppose part of what I would say to you on that is that I don't think any ombudsman can achieve that on their own. So there is a bit, there's a real bit for me about working with um, the committees of the Assembly through yourselves, through health, or three communities and bring into their attention the kind of recommendations that we are making and support around ensuring that they get put in place. Um, there are a number of powers, both in terms of general powers, and I'm, go I'm going to um, ask Sean to come in a minute to make sure I get it right, kids get it wrong, but there is a bit that if, if public authorities don't um, refuse to accept our findings or refuse to put those in place, then we can bring that to the attention of the Assembly. So that can come before the Assembly. And there will also be, under the new Complaint Standards Authority, um, uh, there is a compliance element to it, if that makes sense, so that we will be able to assess the level of compliance of public bodies on their complaints handling and whether or not that is compliant, and then an opportunity for us um, initially to support public bodies to achieve that compliance, but then to bring that to your attention if it isn't. Sean, would you like to come in on that? Because I'm not sure how good a job I've done on that one. I think that is correct, Margaret. So, so in terms of, of recommendations that we make, Joanne, I think you know we do follow up. So we have a system that we call compliance. Now, we have no powers of compulsion. So as Margaret has alluded to, our power is to bring a matter back before the Assembly for their attention where we have made recommendations and those haven't been implemented. So as part of our case handling system, we record all the recommendations we make and then we put bring forward dates on them so that we go back and check for evidence that, that those recommendations have been implemented. One of the other things we do is that we work with other regulatory and oversight bodies to make them aware of some of the recommendations that we make. And sometimes we might ask them to follow up or do an audit to, to show that, that the things that we have recommended have been put in place because they might be better placed. So I think, you know, I'm thinking particularly in health and social care around the role of RQIA. And we do engage quite frequently with RQIA around some of the recommendations that we have made. But we have a fairly good system in place. And, and why did we put that in place? Because in the past, where we were had a cause to go back, and look, we did find evidence that some of our recommendations that had been made and accepted had not been implemented. So, you know, a number of years ago, we realised that there was a need to put a more robust system in place to go back and check and verify. And, and, and actually, complainants really want us to do that. So we're bringing their complaint to us. They don't want people to experience the nature and type of service that they have. So it's really important to give that assurance that the recommendations we have made have been implemented. And we do generally get good cooperation around that from most public bodies. But I think ultimate recourse where, where we have identified an issue is back to the Assembly to bring the spotlight onto that issue and, and for the Assembly to be aware of it. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, John, we're well beyond time. Um, can I bring in Emma Rogan? Uh, Emma, you've, um, you, you've touched on this. Have you any further questions or are you content? Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm fine. I have no further questions, Chair. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. Alan Chambers. No. Sorry, can you hear me now? Can, yes, Alan. Can you? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Just a very quick question. Uh, I welcome the, uh, in the business plan, the, the plans to have a, a user survey and an awareness survey. I think that's uh, produced very useful information. Uh, but just in uh, asking, in, in terms of maybe current experience, uh, have you any sense that the public actually find you by their own efforts, or are they usually directed to you by a third party? So I'm going to try quickly, but I'm just going to ask Sean because he would be better equipped than me. So I think often um, people get referred to us by public bodies. In fact, public bodies should be including with their final complaint um, letter that people can come to us. And I do have a concern that some of those more vulnerable groups don't get to us. Or, for example, on something like the Dunmurray Manor families that they didn't find their way to us. So I do think that's a piece of work, Alan, that we still need to do. And part of my um, focus on both that user survey and public awareness is about trying to shift that. Sean, I don't know if there's anything. I think, you know, if, if people do actually get into the complaint process, Margaret, that's right. They, they will be signposted to us and, and our experience is that's working well. I think the issue is those people who struggle to engage in the complaints process and maybe raising concerns and they're not treated as complaints, they would find it more difficult to get to us, I think, is, is the issue. I think so there is a piece of work and it is part of that complaint standards piece around, you know, how easy and accessible it is for people to engage with the public body. Clearly, where people are expressing dissatisfaction, it should be regarded as a complaint and they should be supported by that organisation to bring forward their complaint and ultimately if, if that's to the ombudsman at the end of it that that's the mechanism and i think there is i think a need for advocacy and support to help people navigate their way through the complaints process and why we will try to simplify that and make it easier through complaint standards i still think there is a role for advocacy and support and um, particularly for people who would find it difficult to engage through complaints processes Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can we bring in Jim Alistair, please? I want to go to the second strategic objective relating to local government. Um, when you say that by promoting confidence in local government by regulating and promoting the Northern Ireland local government code of conduct and delivering a high quality independent investigation and adjudication functions. I made the point before. I'm not going to labour it today, but I'm going to make it again, that you're in a pretty invidious position of being both the prosecutor on the code and the judge. And I think that's a, a, an unsustainable position uh, going forward. But what I really wanted to ask you was, as MLAs, we have a code of conduct. Councillors have a code of conduct. But it seems to me there is a much more stringent approach to conduct on the question of freedom of expression than there is to MLA's code of conduct. Um, is there any correlation between the standards commissioner in the assembly and the local government side of things? as to what standards are acceptable on um, uh, expressions of opinions. Thank you. So I have met um, the um, Assembly Standards Commissioner, um, although she's still relatively new in post. Um, and I know that as part of the review by the Department for Communities, Jim, as I'm sure you already know, that issue around both the Council Code of Conduct and the MLA Code of Conduct came up. Um, I think for 
for me for where I sit in that process. And I do take on board um, and have had a look at the other jurisdictions that have their they are constituted in terms of both investigation and adjudication. And I, I would reassure you that the Chinese wall that we have in the office is one that is very strictly enforced. But I, I accept um, that that's how it was put in place by the Assembly. And that is something for the Assembly, I, I feel, to consider where that might need to go in the future. But I know that um, the Department of Communities and the review of the Code of Conduct for Councillors did consider the Assembly um, code of conduct for MLAs as well. I think freedom of expression is something that has come up. Um, and I know because I was speaking to um, the team this morning that we have had training around um, the European Convention on Human Rights, that freedom of expression and how that get, how we actually interpret and implement that. But it, it has been something, and I know you're familiar um, with Heesum, um, that has come up. I think for the office and we have work to address it for me there's something about that those real those bigger decisions about what's in that code of conduct for mls and for councillors i think for me is a decision that rightly sits with the assembly my role is for us to investigate under the current code of conduct as it stands and then for us to properly and appropriately adjudicate um taken on board all that you've said about that. So I, for me, I mean, I I couldn't say to you right now, though there's a differential there, or I think that needs to be changed. I mean, I do think that's something that belongs with the assembly. I think my focus has really been about going out and engaging. Oh, um, let me just illustrate the point. Recently, the Standards Commissioner in the assembly ruled on a whether a matter which was quite robust language used by an MLA was a breach of the code. And ironically, she quoted a case against the Welsh Public Service Ombudsman uh, as justification for not taking any action. And from that uh, case, she quoted the um, judgment of the judge, which he said in relation to Article 10 that it protects not only the substance of what is said, but also the form in which it is conveyed. Therefore, in the political context, a degree of the immoral, offensive, shocking, disturbing, exaggerated, provocative, polemic, colourful, emotive, non-rational and aggressive language, which would not be tolerated outside this context, is tolerated. That's the, that's the Assembly Standards Commissioner. In other words, say that politicians have a higher threshold in relation to freedom of expression. In any decisions I've read from the local government commissioner, I have not found any parallel. There seems to be an overbearing, restrictive approach to freedom of expression for councillors, which the standards commissioner in the assembly is taking a very different view upon. Surely we need to get no councillors are no different uh, than MLAs, or are they? Um, so I, I would say that what I know when we go out and do training with councillors, that one of the things we ask them is, do you think that you are more held more accountable for, for what you say and how you say it? Um, or is there a higher threshold for you? And most councillors say they think they're held more accountable. And we say, no, there is a higher threshold because there actually is. And... I mean, I wouldn't go in, I cannot go back over what's happened previously, but if there is an issue around that, then I am I'm happy to either write to you on it. But I, what I would say to you is that when we train counsellors and when we provide them information on the code, that we do in that training, because it's a question of, I've asked, alert counsellors to the fact that there is a higher threshold for them around expression of opinion. Um, well, I just respectfully say I don't think some of the rulings that have been given reflect that. That's my point. Thanks. Perfect. Thank you, then. Thank you, Margaret. Um, okay, Margaret, th th that's all for today, and, and uh, we appreciate your time, uh, John, and John as well, uh, and for taking our questions. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Committee. Thank you, Chair. Um, can um, 
they removed. Yes. Uh, can, can Spotty bring all members into the? And Joanne, is Joanne still there? Just, yeah. I thought you lost you there, Joanne. Um, okay, uh, members, uh, return to um, the question around commencement of part three of the Public Services uh, Ombudsman Act uh, 2016. Can I seek your views on whether uh, you're content that the Ombudsman's resource plans are appropriate to allow to carry out the complaints standards role effectively? Are members content that, that or has anyone any thoughts on it? Yeah. The art, sorry, then what was that? Uh, the Ombudsman seems content with the allocation. Yes, yes. Okay, so if, if members are, are content, uh, can I seek agreement to respond? Um, uh, seek agreement um, that the Ombudsman's resource plans are appropriate to allow to carry out our complaints. So if, if we're agreed with that, but just, that's okay, yeah. Everyone's okay with that? Yeah. Okay. Um, if members can take we seek agreement to respond to the speaker advising of the committee's position and a copy uh, of the executive office committee uh, and NIPSO one to the response. Members agreed? Agreed. Okay, thank you. Okay, members, uh, we'll move on to the next item uh, of the agenda, governance arrangements and the offices of the Ombudsman uh, in the UK uh, legislators. Uh, we are very tight for time uh, and we'll have uh, Ryan White with us shortly. Um, so if Spotlight could bring in uh, Georgina and White, can I refer members to page 54 of the meeting pack uh, of your relevant paper? Clerk, is Georgina there yet? No? Um, she is. If Combs can bring Georgina into the Spotlight, please. Yes, there she is now. Georgina, how are you? You're very welcome um, to the committee. Um, can you hear us okay? Yes, I can, Chair. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you very much. Uh, Georgina, we're, we're running over time, so I'll not ask you to go through the paper. Uh, if you're content and, uh, and members are content, uh, we'll go straight to questions, if, if, if okay. Yes, yeah, that's no problem at all. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, we'll... Go to Joanne uh, Bunting. Joanne, are you, are, you, are you okay to start? Could you bring in Joanne Bunting, please? We're getting used to this today, Georgina. <laughs> <laughs> That's it, yeah. Yes, Joanne. Um, okay, if you have any questions for Georgina. Chairman, if it's all right, I'd prefer to hear a bit of the discussion from at the end. Okay, um, that's fine. Um, um, Emma Rogan, has Emma Rogan any questions? Can you hear me now? It's, it's based on the research paper that is there. If, if members are content to, to, to note the research, so we can go straight to questions. I have no questions at this stage, Daniel, thanks. Okay, um, and um, Alan? No, I have no questions either, Chair, at this stage. Uh, Jim Allister? Uh, no, I think I was fairly content with the, uh, the paper. Yes, it, yeah. it sets out the comparisons, which I think we'll be looking to examine whenever we come to the subject of our investigation. But um, yeah. I thought it was a good paper. Yeah, yeah, I, I tend to agree uh, with you, Jim. And, um, I have no overarching questions uh, either, but Georgina, have you anything that you'd like to say uh, or, or add? Uh, no, no, I, I think information on the facts will refer itself. Yes. Uh, um, sort of anything um, other than if members wanted any more clarity. Um, I think sort of the two papers as they merge together sort of it'll make things a little bit hopefully more uh, coherent. Mm -hmm. Members. 
it's, it's very helpful, Gina, a uh, share Jim's thoughts on it, and we do appreciate the effort and work that you put into it, and thank you for it. Uh, I have no questions at this time either, but we just want to thank you. I appreciate that, so we'll, 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 we'll note the research on this case. Okay. No problem. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, members, so next, um, next item of the agenda. Uh, further uh, draft budget 21 22 further consideration uh, can i refer members uh, to page 69 of the meeting pack uh, of the relevant papers At page 80 of the meeting pack uh, is a response from the niac confirming that the contract uh, for the roof project includes an arbitration clause however it is noted that contractual matters fall solely to the assembly commission uh, the response also provides additional information requested by the committee on a number uh, of uh, occasions of 2021-2022 budget matters. Uh, can I ask uh, members uh, uh, whether they have any comments uh, to make or are they content to note? Speak up. So, I, one comment. I thought that in our particular page 90 we were being politely told to mind our own business. Um, yeah. I'm not so sure that our scrutiny role doesn't involve value for money. That was all we did. And, you know, if it was an issue of whether there was value for money in terms of the large amount spent on the roof and their problems, and yeah. I don't think it's just good enough to be told, no matter how brightly you mind your own business. I think maybe the commission's a bit embarrassed by the subject matter, but um, I would certainly like this to keep an eye on it. Yeah. Um it is an interesting one. I think you've uh, put it quite well. Uh, I think this is been told to mind our own business on this occasion, albeit politely. Um, but it, I, I do, I do, I do realise as well that this is an issue for the Assembly Commission um, to resolve. But I, I take your point, Jim, uh, that um, we do need to ensure value for money, um, but. What we do on this occasion, the speaker is more or less saying, keep your keep your nose out <laughs> on this occasion, so we have to decide what to do. Alan, you want in there? Yeah, I didn't think, yeah, fair enough. You know, I take, 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 take a letter in the spirit that it's come to us, that it's, it's maybe none of our business at this time. And uh, if the Commission has the responsibility to uh, you know, chase up the contractor to make sure that the guarantees have been met, that the work was carried out uh, in the proper way. That's all very fine. I think once the Commission have finished their business, I don't think we very much have a role. As Jim has said, we, we investigate value for money and, uh, you know, it's uh, we can scrutinise what happens to the public purse. So I think there will come a point Maybe not today or at the moment uh, to, to maybe to seriously intervene in this, but I think there will come a point uh, where we may be able to uh, express a point of view, and certainly I, I look forward to that day. Yeah, thank you, Alan. Uh, Emma, uh, sorry, go ahead. I was not to just, I, I would have thought we need to send some sort of response, and I thought it might be a response along the lines of but we note the position of. Uh, responsibility of the Commission, but we would ask to be keep, kept informed because we do take the view that this committee has an oversight in respect of value for money and being entitled to know that money was well spent. I think we should. Yeah, I have no objections to that, Chair. If other members are content, we can do that mm -hmm. and note the, note, <laughs> note the correspondence. Oh, uh, is members content to do that? Yeah. So, um, Clark, if we could, we, we could reply. Um, Marie was saying that, um, well, I'm happy exactly with what Jim has proposed. Um, we know yeah, if, I, if I could just clarify, um, Chair, that we want to respond along the lines that, if, you know, when the Commission is in a position to place a value on the work to update us and just highlight the Committee's role in terms of its uh, oversight scrutiny and uh, in relation to value for money. Yes. Is, and are you are you happy for that letter to issue without going back to the committee? Is yeah, from I'm the yeah, it's just quite straightforward. There's no problem. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you, members. Um, thank you, Clark. 
Uh, page 93 of the meeting pack is correspondence from the Minister of Finance on pay pressures and the announcement made by the Chancellor as part of the 2020 spending review regarding uh, the public sector pay freeze. Uh, the correspondence was forwarded to the three independent bodies asking them to confirm whether they took these issues into consideration when agreeing their budget requirements for 21-22. Copies of the responses are at pages 95 to 100 of the meeting pack. The Assembly Commission has advised that it, it took the uh, issues into consideration and no additional pay lift was incorporated into its figures. The Audit Office has advised that it prepared its budgetary requirements in advance of the Chancellor's uh, announcement. The most recent pay award in, in, in the NAAO uh, covered a two year period for 2021 and 21 22, with payment of the second year from the 1st of April 21 being dependent on securing the necessary budgetary cover. The estimated amount for 21-22 for the Northern Ireland Audit Office is £130,000. Um, the CNAG has requested a, a revisit of the pay uh, agreement for 21-22 in light of the announcement on a public sector pay freeze, uh, whilst taking account of the statutory obligations in relation to the remuneration and other terms and conditions of employment of staff at the office. Uh, the Audit Office has advised that it will be engaging with its non-executives on the remuneration committee uh, and also with representatives from the trade unions. This process has started but will take some time. So, has members any thoughts on that? Um, so, basically what the Audit Office is saying is that um, leave the assessment as is and, and they, they, they'll They'll, pick, they'll, they'll deal with it internally, I think is how I'm reading that. Would that be right, Claire? Yeah, I suppose um, this is part of a, a already agreed pay deal, so um, it may well be best to leave that to the, the audit office now uh, and revisit it you know, at a later date once their internal processes have concluded. Yeah. But okay. on the other side of that... Um, okay, well, where, where does that leave everybody else in the public sector that's being treated differently and being told, no, you're not going to get your pay rights? Yeah. What, I mean, do they not have unions? Where's SNPs are not? Do you, do you know what I mean? I, mean, I don't know. I'm not entirely clear why the Audit Office, again, thinks it's, ex, it's exempt. Mm -hmm. Any other comments on it? No. Chair, I unfortunately have to go to the Finance Committee, and I'm going to excuse myself. Okay, no problem, Jim. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, members. Um, so, um, so, so I, th I think we take the, the, the clerk's guidance on this. You know, there's really very little we can say or do about it. It's, it's, it's. They, they've said they're going to look at it, so that, that's. I think we just leave it as is. I presume we're going to have to tell the finance minister that that's the case. But yeah, and also in the assembly, you know, one hundred and forty-six thousand. I mean, and this is the, the the point where Jim comes in. Jim's point over um, the fact that the assembly commission gets whatever it wants without question, really, because everybody else subject to a pay freeze. Does that mean that they also get their increments, or is it just the assembly where people are getting their increments? Yeah, well, your point's well made, John. No, but is that the, um, it's a question, Chairman. It's not a, a point. It's a question. Whenever the Sorry. whenever this finance minister says there's a pay freeze, yes, does that mean people still get their increments? Because what the well, assembly is saying is okay, no pay raise, but people still get their increment. Yeah, Clark, I'm not sure. Do you, do you know? I'm not sure. I'm assuming, I mean, I know in the Assembly, the Commission's response, they had said that there was a figure put into um, their assessment um, and it related solely to the increments, as you say, and not a general pay uplift. Um, and I am not sure whether that is the case with, with the other organisations that we're looking at. I, I actually don't know. I mean, is that, is that, I mean, that's something that we can write out and ask about the the increments. Yeah, I think we just went to check that and to understand fully what they said. I mean, because again, you know, why would the commission think that it's different from everybody else? Yeah. You know, I mean, why would they get increments 
if nobody else in the public sector is getting their increment? I mean, Okay, so just to be clear, you want um, clarification sought from the Assembly Commission um, on... No, I want clarification sought from the Department of Finance the as to what Department of Finance, the, the whether the other departments yes. are, are being Yes, reasonable. whenever they talk about a pay freeze, does that include progression through the grades yeah. and, and associated increments? Yeah, that's grand. Okay. Do you know, it's a fair enough point, is it not? Yeah, well, there's no harm in raising it, yeah, I think. £146,000 of a point. Yeah, okay. Mm-hmm. Clark, are you happy enough to action that, yeah? That's grand. We'll write to the, to the Minister of Finance then to, to seek that clarity. Thank you, Joanne, and thank you, Clark. Let's go to the budgetary figure submitted in October provided for a general pay uplift of up to 2% uh, to apply in 21-22. In monetary terms, this amounts to, to £45,000. The Ombudsman uh, acknowledges that the best available planning assumption is now for a 0% pay up left to apply in 21-22 and is content uh, for the resource budget for 21-22 to be adjusted from the 3.633 million to 3.588 million. Um, I ask members if they're content that the non-ring-fenced uh, Dell for uh, NIPSO be reduced from 3.633 million to 3.588 million. Are you happy with that reduction, 45,000 pounds? I'm just content. See, they're, they're the only ones actually fronting up and saying they'll do it. Uh, yeah, are members content with that? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Item 8.9 on page 101 is correspondence from the Minister of Finance acknowledging uh, the committee's assessment of the 21-22 budget uh, requirements for the three independent bodies and advising that he would reflect the figures in the paper to the executive. However, the Minister asked if the Assembly Commission would engage with Enterprise Shared Service to determine if there is a more cost-effective solution to their capital requirements in advance of the final uh, budget being agreed. The correspondence was forwarded to the Commission and comments were sought. A copy of the response is uh, within your pack on page 102. The Speaker has advised the following the Commission's review in 2016 on the use of EFS. It concluded that the qualitative and quantitative factors covered in the review analysis did not support a move to a greater use of shared services at that time. However, there is a willingness to consider uh, this issue again, particularly if the pricing structures or self-delivery standard have changed since 2016. Can I ask members if they're content that a copy of our correspondence and the Speaker's response is forwarded to the Minister of Finance asking for clarification whether the pricing structures or self-delivery standard for ESS have changed since 2016? Members content? Members, I need, I need you to speak up on the record. Is it, are members content? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank I'm you. Content. See, to be honest, I'm a bit fascinated by the Commission's budget because in circumstances where the Finance Minister is saying that public services are, there's no increase in the whole thing, it's incredibly difficult. The Assembly has, added, has managed to add an additional half a million pounds. Yeah. Chair, yeah. if I just have an idea that I know really what the differences are fundamentally. Yeah. Only there's 104 out of one and 104,000 into another. Funny, funny, that's a very odd figure to just appear twice. Sure. Yes, just to get a complete picture in terms of writing to the Minister of Finance about the, you know, the increments, the progression through the grades for for um, government departments. Just to get the full picture, simply because the Audit Office and NIPSO didn't actually refer to increments. I think we just need to be clear. Are they talking about just the general pay uplift as an increase or or pay progression? So would, just to get the full picture, it might be worth asking them for, for clarity on that. Okay, yeah, I'm content with that. Okay. okay. Um, can I ask uh, members, uh, can we agree to agree their position on the 21-22 budget plans for the three independent bodies? Subject to any relevant responses received to the Department of Finance consultation on 21-22 draft budget, the committee will return uh, to the matter of relevant responses are received. Um, okay, so can we? So, 
Just, just for clarity, Chair, can I just check that regardless of what we get back from the Minister of Finance and from NIPSO yeah. and the Audit Office, members are considering now whether they're agreeing the figures minus the 45,000 from, or minus NIPSO's 45,000. That's what, okay. Yeah, yeah. Just so I'm clear. Okay, I'll agree. Yeah, okay. I'm, I'm not thrilled with the Commission one, to be honest. What, what particularly about the Commission are you not happy about? I'm not happy with the fact, Daniel, that they came to us first with an, an indicative budget that was half a million lower than they've come to us with now in circumstances where the Finance Minister has said that the services that actually serve the public are getting zero increase, but, our, but the Assembly Commission wants half a million pounds extra. Like, what and is they, that happening for? They, 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 they haven't indicated what those specifically are. We can go back and seek clarity on all of these issues from the Commission. It, it seems that there, there are a number of issues outstanding here that we need to get clarity on. The consultation on the budget finishes on the 25th. Um, if members aren't happy to make a, a committee decision on this, um, we would need to either meet again, agree by correspondence. I mean, it is up to yourselves on what you want to do at this stage. Um, if you want to factor in a short meeting for the 25th so that we can get all the information and then come to a final agreement. Yeah, is that, that's probably the most appropriate way forward, Claire. Well, like, obviously, I, I, like, I appreciate, Chairman, that I am one person out of five here, you know, so it's fine. All I'm saying is I'm not thrilled that the Commission has put its best, I'm not convinced that the Commission has put its best foot forward, albeit that there were three years of not spending where appropriate um, and necessary, but in light of the current financial circumstances we find ourselves, in which we find ourselves, I just think the Commission could have put its... Uh, could have put his shoulder to the wheel a bit better, but I appreciate that I'm one person, so it, it's depending on the, how others feel about it. Okay. Claire, Cl Cl wait, just from your own mind, what, what was the half a million for? Do we, do we don't know, do we? Um, I would have to look that up. I don't have the figures right in front of me. It's £126,000 for the progression through the grades. There's yeah. 104000 that they've allocated as new for um, assembly broadcasting. There's uh, fifteen thousand something in there for portraits. But this is what, what I understand about this is my yeah. recollection. We had already seen that in previous indicative budgets, so I don't know why this additional half a million has appeared. Do you know what I mean? Because we they had already added in broadcasting and portraits and all that, unless mm -hmm. I missed something. Claire, can we seek some clarification from the Commission as to what, what the costs are? No? Yeah, we, we can write to the Commission and seek clarity of the increase of the half million. Um, Are okay. there any concerns about this? Sorry, Joanne, what, what did you say there? Am I the only one who has concerns about this? Well, no, but uh, I, I, I trust the judgment of or colleagues that sit on the commission who make up the commission, and I would assume that these are not decisions taken lightly. Um, you know, each of our parties have colleagues that make up that commission, um, so th they make these decisions. Yes, we're responsible for scrutiny of these decisions, um, but I would, I would assume strongly that th these decisions aren't made lightly and are for um, essential reasons. You know. So, yeah, like and, and I get it. I'm just like, concerned too about the potential for reputational damage in circumstances where everybody else is making sacrifices, but the Assembly thinks it's above it because you, you know how that will come across. I mean, you know how it will be. The Assembly has had to adapt considerably in order to meet the challenges of coronavirus. And we are, uh, this is one testament to it today. We're operating remotely. There is a need for investment in the Assembly for uh, remote access to the Assembly Chamber. There's other uh, aspects of broadcasting that needs investment. Therefore, I would assume, and we will see clarity on this, but I would assume that it is tied to some of those COVID related changes that are necessary for the function of. Uh, uh, of members as legislators. But what's kind of bizarre about it is they've increased, for example, the travel costs. 
Now, if, if they're envisaging that people are going to be attending remotely, why is there an increase in travel costs? What's that about? Is that the yeah, I mean, it's, it's minimal, but it's like, what is that? And the other side of it is, um, because th- those figures are set. Yeah. Plus then you've got, um, there was something else about, yeah, they, they've got a very minor reduction really in overall terms for income because they envisage, oh, we're going to be open for weddings and such again. I, I really admire that all the time. But with the best one in the world, that's not anywhere close to what Michael McBride sent them up. Yeah. <laughs> Much as I would really like us to be in that position, I'm not sure that's realistic at all. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. that's yeah. all I'm talking about. Okay. If, you, if we were content, um, John, uh, the clerk will seek some clarification around those points raised. Uh, are you okay with that, clerk? Is there any, anything that you need? I'm fine with that, but am I reading that um, the position in terms of the uh, committee's position on the draft budget, that it remains... In, for the Minister of Finance, it remains the same bar NIPSO yeah. with the reduction yeah. of 45. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Clerk. Um, can uh, members agree uh, that we advise the Minister of Finance and the Committee for Finance accordingly uh, and copy the correspondence to independent bodies? We're all agreed on that, yes? Okay, members. Um, we'll move to the next item of business uh, the review of the governance and accountability arrangement for the Northern Ireland Audit Office and the uh, Northern Ireland Public Service Ombudsman handling arrangements. We refer members to pages 181 of the meeting pack for the relevant papers and remain members for the part of the committee review of the governance and accountability arrangements for the Audit Office and NIPSO. The committee agreed to seek written evidence from a range of organisations and experts with the closing date of January 29th. The committee uh, uh, now, uh, uh, we must now as a committee agree how we wish to proceed. Um, Clerk, uh, can you speak to the paper, please? Thank you. Yeah. Um, as the chair has outlined, written uh, evidence was requested from uh, experts, independent experts, and we've received three responses from Dr. Helen Foster, Professor David Heald, and the Chartered Institute of Public Finance and Accountancy. And copies of the written evidence are provided in your meeting pack. Um, now, that the written evidence really concentrates on governance and accountability issues in the in the audit field. But during a meeting um, that I had with the uh, NIPSO and her officials, another a number of uh, relevant experts were, were suggested in the ombudsman field. Uh, a couple of academics who have published work um, about the role of the ombudsman um, also mentioned was the Irish ombudsman. Um, so the committee needs to look at whether it wants to, to request written evidence from them. If you want to request evidence from the Irish ombudsman, um, now I don't know whether the committee wants to extend it um, to, to there, but uh, you might also consider inviting evidence from the Irish Control and Auditor General. Um, so there's a, so you need to look at that uh, and the academics that NIPSO have identified, whether you want to take evidence from them. Um, obviously, the audit office and NIPSO will be invited to give um, oral evidence at the sort of latter end of the review once we've received all the other evidence. Also, I've listed at paragraph 10 of the paper a number of comparative bodies um, in the audit field and ombudsman. Um, so, I mean, to, to facilitate all of these oral evidence sessions, the committee is going to have to look at um, whether you want to schedule longer meetings to take the evidence or whether you want to schedule more frequent, shorter meetings, for example, a longer meeting with five time-bound evidence sessions. You could do that in two and a half hours or a one and a half hour meeting. You could do three evidence sessions. Um, also, when I was looking through the, the research, that had already been commissioned, there seems to be a gap in relation to the role of the control and other general uh, as accounting officer, and it might be worth getting research on that and looking at the the comparative position in other jurisdictions because that wasn't you know commissioned or wasn't covered in the research that was already been commissioned. But I'll hand over to the chair now to to uh, go through what decisions need to be made. Okay, thank you very much for that, Clerk. Um, okay, members, I, I need you to uh, respond uh, in agreement to some of these things, if, if you're agreeing, that is. So, um, will the members agree that the written submission should be placed on the committee review website? All agreed? Yeah. 
Thank you. Uh, members agree which organization, organizations, experts who submitted oral evidence should be invited to give oral evidence? Do, do we have any thoughts on that? Just a correction there, so who submitted written evidence? That was my error. All right, yeah, sorry, yeah. Who, sub who submitted written evidence? Okay, all agreed, yeah. Which, 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 which organizations? We need to reach an agreement on that, yeah. So does just, it, just, does it just have to be the people who submitted written evidence who are called for oral evidence? Um, it, it, it doesn't have to be, but you had agreed to invite these people to give written evidence first of the vote, um, go on at the starting point. Yes. Yeah, just I suppose it's kind of disappointing when we got three, isn't it? That's where I'm coming from, really. Yeah, and I think that's why, and it, that was the reason why when we had mentioned to, to NIPSO, they are all, all from the audit field, but I think that's because the, the committee had initially just looked at the NIAO, so there does need to be a balance there and getting evidence from, from people in the ombudsman field. Yeah. Okay, so it's clear we, we have to agree which organisations experts. Um, yeah. I want to hear from the three who have submitted, Helen Foster, David Hales, and the Chartered Institute of Public Finance. Yes. Yes. I, 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 yes. You, you can schedule that. Members are all agreed with that, yes? Yeah, I, I'm not clear. I, I wasn't clear that I, I felt that they kind of dealt with what we asked them to deal with. Does that make sense? Am I, did anybody else feel like that? Well, I think it's important that we hear what they have to say first of all, and then we we can we can expand on that a bit more. Yeah, just in terms of their written submissions, it wasn't clear that they kind of dealt with some of the things that we were trying to address because it's not about a power grab; it's about accountability and the best mechanisms to achieve that. And I don't think in, in some responses they they grasped the concept and felt like we were trying to interfere in a way that in which we're not. Yeah, no, I, I, I understand that. So, so are, are, are we agreeing, Kirk, that we invite these people then for ne next week or next meeting, did you say? Next meeting, I mean, we'll, we'll need to discuss when it's appropriate to have the next meeting. Um, obviously, okay. we'll need um, notice. Well, I'm happy for them all on the one day. I know it'll be a long meeting, but do you think we'll get it covered relatively you, short? If you have a sort of... Um, I mean, just to deal with review issues, you could have your three evidence sessions over in an hour and a half. So okay. it's, I mean, it's doable. Yeah. Okay. We can we can schedule that then, Clerk, if members are agreed. Okay. Um, members consider whether any of the experts identified by NIPSU should be invited to submit written and or give oral evidence, including the Irish Ombudsman. Are members? Um. See, just honestly, I think the more information we get, the better. But I think what we need to understand why um, the reason that the Irish Ombudsman is being invited is because he's president of the International Ombudsman Institute, <laughs> not because he's the Irish Ombudsman. You know what I mean? He's like a massive body of expertise. So I, th I think that that has bearing then on you know inviting the Irish Comptroller and Auditor General because you're not inviting him because he's the Irish one. You're inviting. The, you're inviting Peter Tindall because actually he's got massive understanding internationally. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So are we, are we agreed? Yes. Yes. Um, what about the, the two academics that were suggested? They're the academics who have um, produced um, research on ombudsman. Yes. We want to invite them as well. Yes, Clerk, I, 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 I think that's important, yeah. Okay. Objection to that, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, the next point, John, you've touched on, consider whether the Irish Controller and Auditor General should be invited to give evidence, uh, depending on the decision around taking evidence from the Irish Ombudsman. So I think, I think we should uh, consider. Should. Clerk, is that... Um, yeah, I mean, it's up to the committee to decide if they want to take, um, I, I mean, I simply put that um, suggestion in there because you were getting from the Irish control and other general, but 
Joanne had raised the issue that, you know, it's because he's president of the International Ombudsman Institute. Um, so it, it's up to yourselves to decide whether you want to invite the the Irish controller, not other general, or do, you, or do you feel that you have enough information there already in relation to the audit issues? I don't know. See, see with regard to that one, can we hold on asking him until yeah. we start what we're doing with the rest of the audit offices across the, the British Isles and then take a holistic view of that? Um, yeah. So that we're, because I'm conscious that there's very few of these people. They're bound to have relationships with each other and mm-hmm. we don't want... <laughs> You know, it's yeah. about academic things, I think. So if we can just hold and see where we are whenever we yeah. receive the other evidence from the academics and then establish whether or not we want to bring yeah, all that's right. the yeah. oh, generals in, is that okay? Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's okay. the clerk, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, can we agree whether uh, any or all of the comparative bodies should be invited to give oral evidence? Um and those comparative bodies are listed at paragraph 10. Yeah. So with the National Audit Office, Audit Wales, Audit Scotland, and then with the Ombudsman, Scottish Public Services Ombudsman, Welsh Public Service Ombudsman, Parliamentary and Health Service Ombudsman, and Local Government and Social Care Ombudsman. Does that not respond to my previous proposal, which is can we, can we just establish where we are whenever we hear from the academics, see what the gaps are, and then we can talk to them about the practice. Or yeah, if members yeah. agree. I'm yeah. you know, yeah. the best path forward then on the way. So I think that's probably a good suggestion, Joe. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, members, can we agree whether uh, we've touched on this? Um, we have more frequent meetings or, or longer meetings. Uh, uh, in order to take these uh, oral sessions. Um, so I'm just, I have no issue with longer meetings, but I know that it might present an issue for others who have other uh, commitments as well. You're raising a hand there. Yeah. Yeah, sure. It's just in terms of the audit committee, when I look back over the last number of years, see, the audit committee would only meet possibly four times a year. Uh, but suddenly we seem to have become quite a, a, an active committee uh, and indeed we're taking on more and more work uh, and, and adding to uh, already pressurised uh, work commitments that we all have. I, I just wonder, you know, what, what is the rationale? What has changed from the, uh, the, the schedule of the audit committee over recent years to today? Why, why a sudden jump in activity and, uh, and work? Uh, was the committee in the past not doing its function, not doing its job properly? Uh, are we taking up slack that should have been taken up years ago? Or, you know, just what, what is the rationale behind it all? Well, those are very good questions. And uh, believe it or not, a lot of this extra work is of this committee's own making because there is a view at this committee that we should be ex- seeking to expand our powers. And this is a consequence of those issues being raised. So, uh, yes, you are right. Uh, traditionally, the committee only met a number of times in a year. That has uh, changed as a result of uh, members of the committee seeking to explore um, uh, and to expand the powers of this committee as it sits. So, that's the reason we have so much work. That's the reason we have so many evidence sessions ahead of us. Um, currently, uh, these things weren't within the remit of the committee. There are gaps. I think we've all acknowledged there are gaps that really should be at least explored. Um, but uh, there is going to be a, a fair bit of work attached to this uh, to see where the path takes us and what the conclusion will be. So, uh, Alan, I, I take your point. I, I appreciate it. We've all I have education committee on a Wednesday as well. So it, but uh, we're on this path now and we have to see it out. And I think it's the... But Chairman, I don't think, honestly, I don't think we are looking for more power because frankly, I mean, the issue here is finding where's the most accountable place and that's not necessarily us. Um, it's about trying to establish whether or not these people should have presumably independent boards. Um, it's not, it, you know, and the inquiry, frankly, 
I think is only one part of the work. It, it just seems to have grown like topsy. Um, not the inquiry, but the work of the audit committee in general, and that's not that's more than just the inquiry. Um, but I think ultimately, um, Chairman, there was, Alan, you'll recall from previous papers that I mean, the audit committee previously signed up to MOUs that now we're told weren't worth anything, weren't worth the paper they were written on. Um, and now, and previously ignored the fact that there were very serious gaps identified. And I think we have taken a, a more responsible view on that. But the inquiry isn't a power grab. And frankly, I'd be keen to get it over with. But I don't think we're doing the right thing by proceeding with it. Yeah. Um, so Alan, that answers your question, I think. But we, we, we have to, we're, we're doing this now. I agree with the committee to go down this route. So that this is where we're at. Um, but uh, traditionally, the powers of the committee are much more narrow than what we're currently exploring. So that, that, that's, that that's why. So back to my original question, because I need clarification on this. Uh, I would suggest uh, that we have longer meetings as opposed to more frequent meetings till we get this done um, uh, as quickly as, uh, as humanly possible, given our uh, wider commitments as well. So our members agreed to have longer meetings, or is that an issue? And, uh, and we can have shorter, more frequent meetings. It's entirely up to yourselves, but it will be difficult to manage diaries if that's the case. Any thoughts, Joanne? I, Emma? I, don't, I don't mind either way. Okay. It's a problem. Is sorry, Emma. The one thing that I think is a problem, though, is that if you take if, if everybody comes in for half an hour. Um, and they take 10 minutes to present, that then 20 minutes of questions and answers, and there are five of it. Yeah. I still don't know. Yes, I mean, it's up to the committee to decide um, the format of the evidence sessions. I mean, you can be selective. You don't need to bring all these people in. These were just questions that were being asked for you to decide. And we will, you know, you, you can be selective in who you want to bring in. And I think yeah. to your suggestion about hearing from the academics, and you only bring the others in if you, you know, if you want to question them on something maybe that has been raised. Um, you could have, for example, everybody just submit some sort of written evidence and they don't present their paper. It could be that. Um, members simply ask questions, you know, and so a question and answer session. So, I mean, it's up to you to put a, a time frame on the evidence sessions and we can work around that. Yes. I think, Chairman, then I would, I would propose that we don't, that there's no additional presentational time, that we're straight into questions to afford us yeah. the maximum opportunity to tease out issues. Yeah, yeah, no, that's fine. Then we can... Um... Consider that as we go forward. Emily, Joanne, I, I, I always look for a similar approach in, in, in other committees. Um, I do think uh, a lot of these uh, preambles, if you like, can go on a bit long. But yeah, that, I'm happy now. So can, can we say longer meetings then? Agreed, yeah? Okay, okay thank you. Okay, Claire. Um, yeah. And finally, can we agree whether uh, to commission research on the role of the C and AG as accounting officer? for the NAO and the scrutiny mechanisms that exist in relation to the role uh, and the comparative position in other jurisdictions. So if members are agreed, we'll seek that that research. I think that'll be helpful for us all. Agreed, yeah? Yeah, thank you so too. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay, members, uh, we'll move on to the next. Clerk, is there anything do you need there? Is, is that all okay? Yeah. No, that's fine. And what I do is try and schedule the evidence sessions and um, let you know um, when the next meeting date is as, as soon as possible. That, that's great. Thank you. Um, okay, members, the next item of business is scrutiny schedule. Uh, can I refer uh, you all to page 231 of the meeting pack for the scrutiny schedule? Uh, are members content to note? Yes, Joanne, yeah. Well, okay. Uh, can I refer members to page 235 for correspondence received from the Audit Office asking to brief the committee on its corporate plan, business transformation program 2018 to 21, and public reporting forward work program? Can I ask members if they're content to schedule the evidence session? Yes. Yeah. 
Okay, yeah. Okay, folks. Um, correspondence. Um, can the board members, there are five items of correspondence at pages 237 to 272 of the meeting pack. Okay, these members uh, uh, that I want to draw your attention to a few things. I refer members to items 11.1 and 11.2 at pages 237 and 241 of the meeting pack um, for correspondence from three individuals. Clerk has drafted responses to the individuals based on the committee's previous decisions in light of the review and directing them uh, to the published terms of reference. Can I ask members of the content uh, for the responses to be issued? Yeah, I, th I think that the tone of the correspondence we've received just is kind of disappointing. But in mind, we, we absolutely have taken those, those matters seriously. You know, it's just that we're not at liberty to divulge. Yes. Things that we have, information that we have. You know, but it's unfortunate that the folks concerned um, feel that they're not receiving a reasonable standard of service from us as a committee. Yeah, but. We have we, there's a very delicate fine line, and we're dancing on it to be <laughs> very mild. So we are dancing on it, um, but I, I take your point. Um, okay, member, so if he's content for the clerk to issue those responses, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, are you looking in there? Were you no? No, okay, we're content. Okay, thank you. Uh, can I ask members, um, uh, if they can. Can we note any remaining correspondence uh, members as well, or is there anything that you want to specifically look at? Everything else is fine. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, final item. Any other business members? No. Nope. Any these moderators? No. Okay. Thank you. And uh, the date time of the next meeting uh, will be issued in due course. Uh, just before we end, uh, I. Uh, I apologize. I should have introduced our new clerk, who is Marie Austin. <laughs> uh, Marie uh, is in her first year. She's came over from the executive office or the, the, the OFM, DFM, or executive office, or whatever it's called these days. So Marie is, um, we're in good hands <laughs> with Marie. So uh, Marie, thanks very much. And uh, we wish you well uh, with this committee. We're, we're not a bad bunch of people. <laughs> we'll promise. <laughs> <laughs> thank you everybody and uh, if there's uh, anything else we'll be in touch with, with the next date okay then thank you thank you yes. thanks, thanks Claire. Bye. Um, okay bye now bye bye committee room 29